Welcome to module six, the final module in the final reading in fixed income. Uh, this module is a non-technical module, a small one, which looks at some of the issues, more qualitative issues that we would consider when we're investing in global fixed income portfolios and looks at the kind of tools that a fixed income manager would need to run their portfolios. So first up, we're going to think about the considerations that come to light when we're allocating to uh, international bond markets, in particular emerging markets. Um, the first point the curriculum makes is that in emerging markets, you may well find yourself investing in an economy that is um, quite concentrated and heavily reliant upon a dominant industry or commodity. Um, so you might think that you're diversifying in a particular um, economy by taking lots of positions, but actually they're all dependent on the success of a uh, or they're, all, they're all dependent on the oil price or they're all dependent on the success of um, banking and finance um, because the economy is skewed, essentially. Um, you know, the point is, is that developed markets are likely to be more diversified and have significant um, sector differences as well. Um, you know, uh, diff uh, plenty of choice in sovereign names, corporate names, asset backed securities, that sort of thing. That choice in sector differences is likely to also aid the ability to diversify. Um, when you're looking at investing overseas, you should always be wary that there are differences in accounting standards um, across the world. Now we know that IFRS has been adopted by many jurisdictions across the world, but there are still some examples of countries uh, that haven't, not least the United States, uh, Switzerland, that you know, these sorts of areas. And um, you need to think about how that affects ratios, how differences in accounting standards affect ratios. You can't, for example, just compare the current ratio, a liquidity ratio of a US firm um, with the, um, you know, the current ratio of a Swiss firm without checking that um, the numbers that you're seeing for current assets, current, li current liabilities um, are calculated on a similar basis and therefore are comparable. Same goes for profitability. When you're thinking about return on equity, um, operating return on assets, that sort of thing, and solvency, overall debt levels versus uh, equity or versus assets. Um, you know, you, you would also be thinking about whether an entity has more ability to keep assets and liabilities off their books um, in order to make them look less geared than they actually are um, in, in different jurisdictions. Um, of course, also across different markets, you've got different cycles and different, uh, you know, if you've got different economic cycles, then essentially you've got different credit cycles as well. That might be a good thing from a diversification perspective. Um, one of the problems with globalization that we have seen over the last um, few decades is that actually it has made it hard to diversify um, on a global basis because when the global economy tanks, um, it's hard to find somewhere to hide from a, from a geographical kind of perspective. So any differences in the size, timing of, uh, of the credit cycle um, could offer um, diversification benefits. Okay, so when we're investing overseas uh, in fixed income markets, the kind of analysis that we'll be doing is very similar to the analysis that we're looking in domestic markets in terms of assessing willingness and ability to pay. You know, willingness is a, a concern for governments, um, as is ability. The ability of governments to pay their debt really comes from their ability to generate tax revenues from a strong, from a strong economy. So um, that's, what, that's why we'd be interested in where the, um, the income comes from, from the economy, because it's generation of wealth that provides income and it's income that essentially gets generates taxation, income and profits that generates taxation. Uh, we'd also be interested, of course, in debt levels. If they get too high, there might be a question mark over the um, uh, solvency of the of the uh, country. Uh, we'd be looking at things like deficit, a budget deficit. Um, so we're talking a bit more about this on the um, on the next slide. But a budget deficit uh, is where you are living beyond your means as a nation. Uh, it's where you're essentially you're spending as a government more than what you're raising in um, taxes. Uh, so if that's too big. Uh, that's going to have to shrink. Uh, you know, certainly can't keep borrowing and living beyond your means forever. Can you? Anyway, more on more on that in the. Uh, there's more on this in the economic section, actually, isn't there? Um, so yes, the the other thing about uh, governments is that they might choose 
to um, not recognize their debt. That's something that a government can do um, because they make the rules, make the laws. They can call what's called a moratorium or a repu repudiation on their on their debt. And we'd be particularly worried about the government doing that on their international debt. But even if, uh, even if the government uh, doesn't do that, we want to make sure from an institutional perspective that our rights are protected. Uh, no one's going to dismiss the, 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 the payments that they owe us, uh, that contract law is upheld, and that um, we haven't got any geopolitical risks, um, things like wars, or, or just general p political instability in the country, we want to make sure that they're not going to harm our claim, essentially, on the country's debt. The other thing we're going to need to consider, of course, is the exchange rate regime, um, whether it's a fixed exchange rate. Uh, is it credible? Is it likely that the peg, the fixed peg, is going to have to be removed um, and the currency is going to have to weaken? All right. Um, don't forget that uh, if a country does peg its currency to another country's currency, in other words, enact a fixed regime, then it gives up its ability to run its own um, monetary policy. Uh, it's, you know, uh, control its own uh, money supply and interest rates, essentially. Um, this was another thing covered more in economics. Uh, that is, you can't peg to another currency and have autonomy over your monetary policy. Um, what happens is when you peg your currency to another currency to set to fix the exchange rate, is you essentially import the monetary policy of the country that you are pegging your exchange rate to. But more of that in economics. Okay, so these are the kind of indicators that you'll be looking at when you're thinking about the credit risk of a sovereign nation. And um, we've already mentioned the budget deficit. Um, that's how much we're spending in excess of our taxes. Um, usually we think of this in terms as, uh, or, or relative to GDP, as a percentage of GDP. GDP is the overall activity, the income at this stage at level three. We know, I think we know all about that. And so we're worried if the budget, budget deficit is alarmingly high. Um, it means that the country is living beyond its means. And uh, it's also borrowing a lot relative to its income. Uh, so, um, you know, it's living beyond its means um, in, in quite a drastic way and is going to struggle to pay back the debt. Of course, the balance of the debt is of, um, of concern as well. So particularly external debt, debt owed to um, uh, other countries. Uh, not necessarily internal debt in its own currency. Uh, as we see across the world, indebted nations uh, that have debt in their own currency can just create that currency to pay it back. It is essentially and eventually a, uh, an inflationary policy, um, but uh, they can do that. What they can't do is create another country's currency. And that's why it's more of a concern if there's large external debt uh, with regards to explicit default. Um, so financial leverage is often, we often look at external debt to GDP and um, liquidity wise, uh, the assets that we have to fund payments on foreign debt, we'd look at foreign currency reserves relative to GDP. Obviously uh, riskier, generally we'd say it's riskier if we've got a high budget deficit, riskier if we're more geared as a country with external debt, uh, riskier if our currency reserves are lower because we've got lower reserves to tap into to make good on our near-term payments. Now, you might be looking out for like some bright lines here, like what, you know, budget deficits, GDP, you know, what's good? Is uh, is 2% bad? Is 4% bad? 6%, 8%? Um, I don't think the exam really works like that. Not usually. Um, the exam will kind of give you, if this stuff is tested, the exam will give you maybe two or three different countries with these statistics in and it will be a relative game. There'll be one of them with a high, um, there's likely to be one of them with a high budget deficit relative to GDP, a high external debt relative to GDP, low currency reserves, and you have to pick out the one, that country as being riskier and briefly justify why, the sorts of reasons that we've been chatting about here. Right, um, the reading talks a little bit about structured products here. Um, structured products we know very well from previous levels. These are our um, mortgage-backed securities and asset-backed securities where there's some collateral, um, which is backing our structured instrument. Our structured instrument is essentially a bond which gives us the right, um, or gives us access to the returns and the risks of a pool of illiquid collateral like mortgages or consumer debt, like credit cards, that sort of thing. 
Uh, more sophisticated um, structured products have tranching. Um, uh, tranching is where we have different uh, seniority of these structured instruments with regards to some risk factor. So we might have a senior tranche, which uh, essentially suffers credit losses last. The junior tranche suffers any credit losses from the collateral first. So, you know, here's the collateral of mortgages or loans. What we know is that um, uh, any defaults in the collateral flow to junior tranches first, which gives senior tranches some subordination in the structured product, um, in the structure of the structured product. Uh, these senior tranches can then be given a high credit rating, um, much higher than maybe the underlying collateral, um, if there's enough subordination. These junior tranches are junk though, aren't they? Um, literally, you know, they might not even be rated. Um, so, yeah, this kind of, you know, um, subordination uh, is one of the things that maybe got a little bit out of hand prior to the credit crunch. Um, you know, these uh, subprime mortgages that were packaged up and then essentially financed through selling these um, these structured products. And um, that subordination was was uh, was not as, not as um, shielding to credit risk as we first thought. And that was because um, the loans in the underlying collateral were really poor and they tended to have high default correlation. They all defaulted at once. So there wasn't really any protection. But that's another story, isn't it, for another day. Um, so the general name for these instruments that tranche, um, that offer different levels of seniority in their notes, um, they're referred to as CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, or CLOs, collateralized loan obligations, if you've got loans in the underlying collateral pool. Um, they allow, um, you know, they do allow investors to target a certain level of risk, whether it be credit risk or, as we've seen along the years, prepayment risk, something like that. Um, you may even get unfunded CDOs. Now, an unfunded CDO is where the investor, which presumably is buying one of these tranches, doesn't have to make a payment up front. OK, um, they only have to make payments in if they suffer losses. And of course, that's like a derivative, which is unfunded and it's, um, you know, giving implicit leverage to the investor. And if they don't have to put capital up up front to fund their position, then they are entering into a geared position. OK, finally, in this module, we're going to talk about the tools that a fixed income manager um, needs to run a fixed income portfolio. Um, so, yeah, I think this stuff is really self-explanatory. It's really just summarizing the sorts of ideas that we've already been talking about. Uh, we are going to need data. Um, we're going to need data coming in from a data provider. Um, on uh, relevant market yields, yield curves, changes in prices, exchange rates and volatilities. We're then going to impose upon that what we want to see. So we're going to impose upon that our risk metrics like uh, value at risk, um, scenario analysis that we think um, is important, um, maybe even filter out uh, based on filtering based on ESG ratings. And we're also going to be thinking about building our portfolio subject to our our uh, unique, well, our personal, um, as an investor, our specific investment objectives and constraints. So the liquidity that we need as a constraint, our risk um, objective with regards to our risk budget, our return objective, our time horizon as a constraint. These will be imposed upon, um, effectively upon the data as well through these models. The output, of course, will be like an asset allocation, a summary of uh, asset allocation, um, uh, both in terms of what we should allocate to over the long term, plus um, how we're actually allocated, how our portfolio is getting on, what our risk exposures are versus our um, neutral position, uh, which we view as a benchmark, and um, you know the outputs of risk and scenario analysis. Also, a summary of any trading and our cash management process. This would be the output of a fixed income analytics system, really telling you how you're getting on where your big risk exposures are, what worked, what didn't work, versus your uh, neutral benchmark portfolio, and what trades you've done, and the impact of those trades um, in a particular time period. Okay, that completes the final module of fixed income. Uh, as I said right at the start of all of this, this is a very important area, and we've seen it all now. Okay, the, the things that rise to the top from an exam perspective, um, are things like uh, immunization, uh, things like trading the yield curve, uh, suggesting the right strategy, um, trading the credit curve with either CDSs or the underlying bonds, uh, 
that five step return decomposition that's come up like three times interpolation has come up many times these are the things that you really need to focus on to make sure you score well in this very important area